Good afternoon, and thanks for tuning in. I'm your host, Kathy Still. The U.S. government says there are no political prisoners in this country. However, there are more than 100 men and women serving unusually long sentences in U.S. prisons because of their political beliefs and activities in support of those beliefs. Many of the names you're familiar with, uh, Geronimo Pratt, Mumia Abu-Jamal, Leonard Peltier, but the names of many others are completely unknown, even to activists. Today, we're going to look at two such people, the case of Black Panther Party political prisoners Ed Poindexter and David Rice, who now goes by the name Mondo Wilonga. That's what's beneath the surface today on this Tuesday, April 28th. But first, this news update from Frank Stoltz. We're back on Beneath the Surface. I am your host, Kathy Still. Thanks for tuning in today. Today we are going to take a look again at political prisoners. Of course, the U.S. government says there are no political prisoners in this country, even though more than 100 men and women are serving unusually long sentences in U.S. prisons because of their political beliefs and the activities in support of those beliefs. These men and women are political prisoners. We know the names of Geronimo, Mumia, Leonard Peltier, but the names of so many others are completely unknown and their stories have never been heard. Today we're going to take a look at the case of two such individuals, Black Panther Party political prisoners Ed Poindexter and David Rice. They were framed, they say, for a bombing in Omaha, Nebraska. And we're going to take a look at their case today. I just want to give a little background, though. As many of you know, the FBI under J. Edgar Hoover launched a counterintelligence program in 1967 to isolate and neutralize and eliminate those individuals and groups that they considered to be dangerous to U.S. interests. A list of individuals and groups was compiled by the FBI and they were targeted for surveillance and action. These groups were groups like the Black Panther Party, Deacons for Defense, the Southern uh, Leadership Conference, the Republic of New Africa, the American Indian Movement, the Black Liberation Armies, and many others. In some cases, the FBI resorted to outright murder to move people, such as Fred Hampton, Mark Clark, Woody Green, and in other cases, they framed individuals so that they would be incarcerated for unusually long sentences and be neutralized in that way. Again, we're going to look today at the case of Ed Rice and David Poindexter. And joining me in studio today are two people to help us examine the case. Buddy Hogan was a longtime resident of Omaha, Nebraska. And for 10 years, he was the president of Omaha's branch of the NAACP. He knew young David Rice when he was a student at Crichton Prep and Buddy's now a resident of California and our guest today in studio. Buddy, thanks for coming in. Thank you very much for having me. We're also joined by Kitrin Zeigel. She's been doing research on the case since 1995, and she co-wrote a script for a video uh, about, Ed Poindex or about uh, Ed Poindexter refuting the evidence against him and Mondo, uh, the name that David Rice now goes by. And Kitrin, thank you for joining us. Oh, thank you for having us, Kathy. Now, uh, on Sunday, Kitrin and I came in and we made several phone calls. Uh, Kitchen's done quite a bit of research. It actually went to Omaha, interviewed people, and what we did was we called some of those people and interviewed them so that you could sort of hear the testimonials from people who knew uh, who knew Ed Rice and David Poindexter. David Rice and Ed Poindexter. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and we're going to start off hearing a tape uh, of uh, of uh, some, uh, someone from the uh, uh, Black Panther Party. Uh, this The first person up on the tape is Sister Hadesha Mariam. She was the founder of Des Moines Black Panther Party, and she knew uh, Mondo and Ed. All right, and we're going to go ahead and uh, hear about three minutes of testimonials. Yeah, my name is Sister Hadesha Mariam, and I'm located in Des Moines, Iowa. We're familiar with the Omaha chapter as well as other chapters in the Midwestern region. We support the innocence of our two brothers who have been incarcerated for over a 30-year period. We know that they, too, have fell victim of the government's pro in an effort to disrupt, discredit, and destroy any effort that was taking place in the 60s that raised questions of human rights violations. And if we check the records of the 60s, we know that the 
FBI was uh, instrumental in setting up uh, many of the innocent individuals. We look at the case of Geronimo Pratt, who is just now being uh, released, given that the FBI was well aware of his innocence and had buried their information in their file. We look at the uh, Chicago, Illinois chapter, the FBI's role in the assassination of Mark Clark and, and uh, Fred Hampton. And so we see a consistent pattern, as well as we were familiar with those two brothers, and we are well aware of their innocence, as well as the government failed in its attempt to bring evidence forward to convince anyone who would read the records of their guilt. I'm Jack McCaffrey, Jack McCaffrey, and I was pastor of Holy Family Church in Omaha from uh, 1967 to 79. Dave Rice, as he's known in those days, was a neighborhood worker, a guitarist, pioneer, a uh, so really a great inner city parish that attracted people from all over the city. In those days, the race situation, of course, was deteriorating, and Dave became more and more, he had been raised as a Catholic kid in Catholic schools that were mostly white, and he became more and more aware of his own blackness. I think he seemed to have to prove to himself and to the black and white community both that he was as black as any of them. Dave's not uh, not capable of killing. He's, a, he's really a gentle man who got caught up in, uh, in the history of the time. My name is Nan Graff. I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. And um, a black minister and his wife, who were active in the Civil Rights Movement, took me to the Nebraska State Penitentiary in 1974 to meet Ed Poindexter and David Rice. As co-chair of the ACLU Prisoners' Rights Committee, I started attending the Monday night meeting of 111 JCs a prison group sponsored by the JCs of Lincoln, Nebraska. At that time, Ed Poindexter served as president and Mondo as secretary of the prison group. What they did, they brought their leadership skills as black activists into the prison with them and helped other men get involved in constructive, productive programs at the prison. I've always been impressed with the intelligence and the energy of both of these men. And I think they're both very constructive, productive men. And uh, they simply came to prison and started community organizing uh, to get the best out of most of the people that they were involved with. Just a few voices of people who knew David Rice and Ed Poindexter, David Rice, who now goes by the name Mondo Wilonga. And I'm joined in studio today by Buddy Hogan and Kitrin Zeigel. We're looking at the case of Black Panther Party political prisoners who uh, were framed for a bombing in Omaha. Now, uh, uh, Buddy, go ahead and tell us the story of what happened to these two men. Well, to be fairly succinct about it, uh, we have to go back in time to the late 60s and in the United States in the 60s, and particularly in the late 60s, it was a different time, and particularly for those who weren't alive at that time or weren't old enough to know, it was very contentious, uh, not only with race relations, but with many other uh, contentious issues, some involving uh, gender, some involving age. We were beginning in the 60s to send advisors to South Vietnam to help the French in their colonization efforts and the long-standing battle uh, with the indigenous people of Vietnam, which later turned into such a catastrophe. And there were uh, groups forming, and in the African-American community, one group specifically, the Black Panther Party, was formed in an effort to um, try to do things uh, for ourselves in the community as opposed to having others do them for us. It was a movement uh, geared towards self-determination, uh, concerned about uh, issues involving education of our children. Uh, they started the first school breakfast programs, if you will, uh, school feeding programs for children. It's very difficult for children to learn on an empty stomach. They started school lunch programs. They started after-school learning activities for children, um, senior uh, citizen uh, activities. Uh, they were concerned about the enforcement of law in the community, and uh, they were engaged in a lot of activities that by any uh, stroke of the imagination would be viewed as imaginative and uh, very positive. 
they were portrayed to the general public as being reactionaries, activists, militants, and other malcontents who uh, ultimately in their confrontation with the system, and you have to remember that the system is essentially about maintaining the status quo in terms of legislative actions, in terms of police. The function of the police is to maintain order, to maintain the current order, which is to maintain the status quo. That's true regardless of who happens to be in power. And so the Panthers and other organizations were uh, basically promoting the good of the community in an effort to get things to change. In doing that, you will run up against opposition from the status quo, uh, the government, if you will, the police specifically, who are charged with the responsibility to enforce that. And so the Panthers ultimately confronted the police in any number of uh, activities uh, throughout the country. They became targeted by the police, principally by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, which at that time was under the leadership of uh, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, a man uh, who by any account was uh, certainly fairly narrow-minded. He was extremely conservative um, and feared the Black Panthers and feared any indigenous group's uh, efforts to control their own destiny because he saw them as a threat to the stability of the American Republic. He actually feared them. And so he started a program uh, called COINTELPRO, uh, for short for counterintelligence program, which was geared at trying to disrupt these organizations, to discredit the individuals involved, to do anything necessary to get them out of the way, to make them ineffective. And amongst the tactics that the FBI used, and of course we didn't know about this at the time, didn't know later till the mid-70s, and specifically um, Mondo and Ed's attorneys didn't know about until 1978 in terms of these specific activities targeted against these two individuals. But they engaged, among other things, in uh, lies, and uh, uh, they would send uh, prostitutes uh, to meet with some of the leaders, uh, filming, and trying to discredit and disrupt the organizations by any means necessary, as um, would commonly be uh, described today. Mm -hmm. So what were Ed and David charged with? Well, in 1970, a police officer in Omaha uh, was killed in a booby trap uh, situation. There was a call made from a vacant home on the, uh, as the, as the public calls it, the near north side in Omaha, which is a euphemism for the black community in Omaha. There was a vacant house. There was a call that a woman was being assaulted. Uh, the police arrived in numbers. There was a suitcase on the front porch. Uh, they proceeded in looking for the woman that was in distress. Some went upstairs, some went to the kitchen and so forth. One of the officers pulled uh, up and uh, picked up the suitcase on the front porch. It exploded. He was killed instantly. Buddy, can I interrupt you? you Looks sure like can. we've got Dave Herzog, Gloria, and Rayanne on the line, so if we can Great. have them join us. Okay. Uh, Dave Herzog, he was the defense attorney for David Rice in 1971, and uh, he had the case successfully overturned in federal court in 1974. Dave, thanks for joining us today. Hi, Dave. Are you with us? Here in Omaha. Now I understand you just had some uh, some uh, dental, dental work, work done. <laughs> so I, right, I survived. Oh, I really appreciate you being with us today. We were just talking a little bit about the uh, the case, uh, and uh, you were David Rice's uh, attorney. Tell us uh, some of the specifics of the case. A uh, day before you start, this is Buddy Hogan. I've been rambling on about some of the background, and uh, you might want to take it actually from the beginning of the case. Well. The beginning uh, has a historical genesis. In 1968, 1969, uh, North Omaha, uh, as Buddy called it, the Near North Side, which was a journalistic uh, jingoism to refer to uh, the area uh, intensely uh, populated by members of the African American community, was uh, under intense police scrutiny. Uh, the uh, the effects of uh, the social unrest of uh, the uh, Vietnam uh, War, the uh, plight of uh, police uh, conduct in the uh, in the uh, African American community, uh, culminated, I think, uh, with the, uh, the period of 1968-1969 when there was an awful lot of 
protest against the status quo uh, and many other uh, social undercurrents occurred. Uh, what uh, Buddy alluded to earlier, what we didn't know was that uh, there was a police uh, intelligence uh, effort underway to um, uh, monitor uh, black advocacy exercising their rights under the First Amendment to protest and uh, police brutality and uh, police uh, excesses, and uh, that kind of gives you a uh, uh, kind of a background. Uh, it's uh, it, it, it's uh, been a long time uh, uh, since the uh, events uh, North Omaha North Omaha burned up in about 1968. If I'm not correct, if I'm not correct, buddy, uh, I think that's when North 24th Street suffered some. Uh, burning and some riots uh, uh, that again called forth police uh, activities which were of brutal proportions. Um, but in any event, uh, in 1970 uh, there was a federal search warrant issued uh, to seize some rock quarry dynamite that had been brought into the Omaha community. It's my understanding that the rock quarry came from a burg the rock Corey Dynamite came from a burglary in Des Moines and was brought to Omaha by members of a motorcycle gang. Uh, the members of the motorcycle gang then, then uh, uh, transferred the, uh, the sticks of dynamite uh, to the NCCF, which was called National Committee to Combat Fascism, which uh, Dave, David Rice and Edward Point Dexter and uh, others, the Peaks and uh, many others were affiliated with. Uh, it was sort of a... Uh, a mean uh, uh, joke, as it were, by these motorcycle people hoping that these blacks would kill each other with this very unstable rock quarry dynamite. Um, the rock quarry dynamite purportedly, according to the police version, was brought to David Rice's house and at David Rice's house, supposedly, according to the contingents of government, a suitcase, uh, a Samsonite suitcase was uh, filled with this rock quarry dynamite and brought to the house that Buddy uh, referred to. Police were called to the house. Uh, the, the, uh, a a clothespin uh, apparatus was purportedly used uh, to wire the uh, suitcase to a floor. And when the police officer uh, picked it up, Larry Menard, I believe was the name of the police officer, uh, the device exploded, virtually collapsing the house. Uh, David Rice uh, uh, was then sought uh, as uh, a culprit, but it's really amazing that the search, that the arrest warrants were issued. They were issued on the basis that uh, a police officer had been killed. That uh, this NCCF, National Community Combat Fascism, uh, advocated violence toward police officers, all based upon the rhetoric that uh, Dave Price and others were espousing. And it was only because of their association affiliation with the NCCF that these arrest warrants were, were issued. Uh, they were subsequently uh, uh, dismissed uh, until uh, Dwayne Christopher Peake, a 15-year-old, was ultimately uh, kind of, uh, was ultimately interviewed by uh, police officers, and he told uh, a bizarre set of stories. I remember during the trial, I think I must have charted seven different stories about where the so-called suitcase with the so-called contents of dynamites came from and who built it and so forth and so on. Uh, the story, I think, really has some amazing aspects to it because a search warrant was obtained by a, a lawyer that uh, Buddy knows, uh, J. William Gallup, who was then an assistant U.S. attorney at the time, uh, apparently an informer uh, of the type and stripe that Buddy was referring to, had, a, had told the, uh, the FBI that there was a house in North 24th Street that had this rock quarry dynamite on it. And what ensued was a debate between who was going to execute the search warrant, whether it was going to be the FBI, whether it was going to be the ATF, the Alpha Tobacco Tax and Firearms Division of the Internal Revenue Service, or some other law enforcement agency. And because there was such uh, interagency rivalry and competition to be able to execute the warrants, it's my understanding that the warrant was, was canceled. Now, the theory that I have espoused for all these years since 1970 is, is that had these police officers not vied for the glory of executing search warrant, I think that uh, the dynamite would have been found, uh, not at David Rice's house, but at a house in North 24th Street. And Officer Menard didn't have to die, nor did the 
other sundry police officers have to suffer the severe injuries that they sustain. Dave Herzog was the uh, defense attorney for David Rice in 1971 yep. and, and uh, had the case successfully overturned in federal district court in 1974. We're talking today on Beneath the Surface about the case of David Rice and uh, Ed Poindexter. David Rice now goes by the name Mondo. This is Beneath the Surface. I'm your host, Kathy Still. We're going to continue with their story in just a moment right after this quick 60-second break. Stay tuned. Wednesday on Up For Air. A Guatemalan bishop has been murdered one day after releasing a report on human rights abuses by the military. The GOP is hoping to raise interest rates on student loans in order to keep commercial banks in the market. And we'll showcase the spoken word of some very young writers. I'm Marco Stromer. And I'm Kathy Glory. I hope you'll join us Wednesday morning starting at 7 a.m. on Up For Air. KPFK, Los Angeles, 90.7 FM, listener-sponsored Pacifica Radio for all of Southern, Southern California. Stay tuned for more Beneath the Surface. Can we get another This hours? is Beneath the Surface on KPFK, 90.7 FM. It is a complicated story, but uh, we're going to cover it here today. We've got several people with us today. Buddy Hogan is in studio with us. He was the president for 10 years of Omaha's branch of the NAACP. He's now a resident of California. Kitrin Zeigel's here. She's been doing research on the case since 1995. Uh, we're joined on the phone by Dave Herzog, who was the defense attorney for David Rice back in the 70s. And we've got a couple peop other people on the line. Also, uh, Ed Poindexter, I spoke with him on Sunday, and um, hopefully he will be uh, uh, able to call in from prison today to be with us on the air. We're going to go to uh, Rayanne Schmitz right now. She was She's an attorney who was active with the uh, Defense Committee, um, and uh, she was uh, with David Rice at her house the night of the bombing. And um, so we're going to go ahead and uh, hear from Rayanne. Hi, Rayanne. Are you with us? Hi, and thank you. Um, I, I was not an attorney at the time. I was a, a student activist mm -hmm. along with a number of other student activists who and, were... And you were with David Rice. Pardon me? And you were with David Rice that night. Well, yes. He was a personal friend of, of mine. He was um, the boyfriend of one of my roommates, and he had spent the, the night at our house that night. We had been up till very late, two o'clock probably in the morning, eating popcorn and giggling. Um, Mondo is a lot of fun. He's a, a very fun person. He's intelligent and bright and and um, fun to be around. And that's how I mostly remember him. And um, after that, you know, I went to bed and and sometime during the night the, the bombing occurred. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I don't believe that Mondo had anything to do with it. I don't think he knew that it happened. Um, I don't believe that there was any part of his person that could be a part of, of that kind of violence. He was very interested in protecting the African-American community from violence. I remember during the, um, the burnings that David Herzog referred to that David was standing atop... Uh, the roof of, a, of the Mothers for Adequate Welfare building uh, because he was very concerned that it might catch fire and so he was up there with a hose and, and, and was trying to protect that building so that nothing would happen to it and because he was so supportive of of the cause for women and children at that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing the kind of person that that, uh, that Mondo was, that David Rice was, does it seem likely to you that knowing that he was under scrutiny, that he would have this dynamite in the basement of his home? No, I don't, I don't, I don't believe that. I, I don't know. I don't believe that for a minute. I, I just don't. Um, Kitrin Zeichel, in a, in a conversation with her just the other day, told me the description that an, an, an African-American police officer at the time, and there were very few of them in 1968, and, and this particular man is the man that, that Mondo turned himself into when he found out that a warrant uh, was out for his arrest, and this man's name was Pittman Foxall. And, and Officer Foxall 
said that he had known David Rice since he was three feet tall and that that he was not capable of tearing the wing from a butterfly. And, and I think that's just a perfect characterization of David. He's a, a peaceful person and, and, and not the kind of person that would have um, plans to do any such kind of violent thing. He just, it just was not in his nature to do that. All right, Rayanne, I want to thank you for being with us. And, uh, and uh, Kitchen, let me ask you uh, to talk about some of the details. It's easy for a person to say they're innocent. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of uh, extenuating circumstances in this case. Uh, Dave Herzog mentioned the, the case of Dwayne Peak. He uh, uh, confessed, said that, uh, that he had actually planted the bomb and then he later recounted and there's a very curious uh, event that took place while the trial was going on. Can you tell us about that? Well, I actually have um, a different perspective on the case than a lot of thing people do because I'm not convinced that Dwayne Peake actually placed that bomb. Mm -hmm. uh, the only African American. First of all, tell us. And he was the main witness against Mondo and Ed. He was uh, seen on the near north side with a suitcase the night of the bombing. Mm -hmm. He had a legitimate reason to have a suitcase. He was leaving the state in a matter of days to join the Job Corps. He did not have a place to stay. His father had thrown him out of the house. He stayed with his sister or his friends, and he was going around collecting his clothes so he could leave the state. And uh, his sister dropped him off in the old neighborhood. He grew up at a house at 2809 Ohio. So on that Sunday night, his sister drops him off near the old house. The house that blew up was 2867 Ohio. It was like a couple of houses up the street. Mm -hmm. His sister testified at the trial that she drove into the alley and they watched him walk towards the house. And when I met her for the first time, she interrupted me when I said, you drove in the alley. And she said, I never drove in the alley. So it's possible that she drove him to the old neighborhood where he knew absolutely everybody. She dropped him off. and. Since he was the last person seen in the neighborhood with a suitcase, he becomes the prime suspect in this policeman's murder because it was a suitcase bomb. And confesses to a bombing he didn't commit? Okay, now this is where um, the search warrant that Dave Herzog mentioned is very, very important. I have a copy of the search warrant right here. It took me years to get my hands on this mm -hmm. thing. And in the search warrant it says that a 12-year-old girl named Mary Alice Clark witnessed five men making a bomb on July 15th. The five men were Frank and Will Peake, who were first cousins of Dwayne Peake, two other brothers, and I don't know the two men, so I don't want to say their names on the radio, and a fifth man. And according to this search warrant, she watched these five men make a bomb. She saw machine guns in the Panther headquarters. She saw boxes of dynamite. And uh, this warrant was never served, not because of fighting between the police and the FBI as to who got to serve it, but according to the World Herald, um, the ATF, it's not an FBI warrant, it's an ATF warrant. The ATF contacted the Justice Department in Washington and they told them that the information was not credible, that the, the informant herself was not credible. And um, so I think that if you showed Dwayne Peake this warrant and said to him, if you don't implicate David Rice and Edward Poindexter and say that they made this bomb and told you to place it, we will put you on trial. And it, right in his c confession, one of his depositions, he says to this police officer, nobody's going to believe that I didn't do this because I was the last person seen in that neighborhood with that suitcase. Mm -hmm. Furthermore, uh, if they showed him this warrant, and if you read this warrant, I don't want to read it on the air because it's five pages long, you would be convinced that these five men made this bomb. So conceivably, they could have shown him this warrant and said, if you don't convict these two guys, Rice and Poindexter, then we're going to go after your first cousins, Frank and Will Peak, and we have this warrant that proves that they made a bomb, and nobody's going to believe that they did not. So he came forward, confessed to the bombing. Before we talk uh, any more about Dwayne Peak, though, let's talk about the 15-year-old witness. Her family didn't know anything about 12 her. years or, old. Or 12 years okay, old. Okay, imagine this. An ATF agent somehow meets a 12-year-old girl. I don't know how she would come in contact with an ATF agent. He never tells her mother that he put her name on a federal search warrant. According to her sister, Vicki, a month after her name was put on this warrant, she disappeared into thin air, she was never seen again, and her parents declared her dead. You would think that if she saw five men make a bomb, she might be in a little bit of danger. You would also think that if a 12-year-old girl saw five men make a bomb, she'd be telling everybody she knew, or she'd tell somebody, you know. She, would, she might not be able to keep that to herself. Her family can't corroborate the information in the warrant. She never told any other friends that, you know, she saw this 
stuff happen. And I was the first person actually to go to the Clark family to ask, you know, what can you tell me about Mary Alice? How did she meet the ATF agent? They had no idea what I was talking about because nobody ever went to them and said, Mary Alice is the informant in this warrant and what can you tell us about what she knew or no what she saw? No law enforcement people from any agency. No, nobody ever told the family that they'd used this 12-year-old girl and put her name on an ATF warrant. Mm -hmm. uh, attorney uh, Dave Herzog, you defense attorney for David Rice in 1971. Uh, uh, let me bring you back into this. Were you aware of this information at the time? Uh, no. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so let me ask you about the case of Dwayne Peak. He first confessed, and then, as I understand it, there was a break in the trial, and he came back looking completely disheveled and beat up and changed his story and said that it was uh, David Rice and Ed Poindexter. Tell us about that. Well, uh, in Nebraska, we have uh, a system of preliminary hearings rather than grand juries. In other words, they... A judge hears evidence to determine if there's a crime committed and if there's probable cause. I'll never forget the judge's name. His name was Simon A. Simon. And Judge Simon uh, convened a preliminary hearing for David Rice at 9 o'clock in the morning at the uh, court uh, where preliminary hearing probable cause uh, to uh, proceed further with uh, felony accusations. Dwayne Peake walks into the courtroom. He is asked if he knows the two defendants sitting at the table, David uh, Rice or Edward Poindexter, and uh, Dwayne Peake says he doesn't recognize anybody in the courtroom. Uh, a recess is uh, requested over strenuous objection, and uh, the proceedings are then continued for the afternoon. In the afternoon, uh, Dwayne Peake comes into the courtroom with his grandfather and with a elderly, stately police officer by the name of Bill Coleman, and Dwayne Peak is wearing sunglasses. I ask him to take off his sunglasses. He takes off his sunglasses. His eyes are puffy. He's crying. There are bruises around his eyes. And I ask him what happened to him, and he uh, wouldn't uh, describe. There were halts and uh, stops in his uh, recitation of the facts, and very hesitatingly, he then identified David Rice and Edward Poindexter being at David Rice's house assembling a bomb. Mm. This is Beneath the Surface on KPFK 90.7 FM. I'm your host, Kathy Still, and today we are taking a look at two of the na two political prisoners, uh, David Rice, who now goes by the name of Mondo Wilanga, and Edward Poindexter, two political prisoners, one of over 100 political prisoners in America whose names no one knows of, but they're in jail serving long sentences in very tough conditions because they stood up for what they believe, because of their what they said and what they did. And in studio with me today is Buddy Hogan. He was the president of the Omaha branch of the NAACP. Katrin Seigel is with us. She uh, had did research on the case uh, since 1995, and we're joined on the line by a couple of people who uh, knew uh, David Rice and also by uh, Dave Rice's attorney. Dave Herzog, let me ask you, the case was um, uh, successfully overturned. You had it successfully overturned in federal district court in 1974, right. Right. but they're still in prison. What happened? What happened very quickly was that uh, the uh, jury uh, heard the evidence and had uh, at that time the choice of either asserting uh, rendering either a guilty verdict and assessing either uh, the pain of death in Nebraska to the electric chair or life imprisonment. Uh, they assessed uh, de uh, life imprisonment, uh, which uh, I think is rather telling with regard to the rather seamy and very, very bizarre number of stories that uh, Dwayne Peak told and the other evidentiary facets that I uh, just don't think we have time to talk about. Uh, that case uh, was then appealed from the trial court to the review court, the Nebraska Supreme Court, and the Nebraska Supreme Court affirmed the conviction. The theory all along, both at the trial level and in the Supreme Court, was the sufficiency of the search warrant. That was a warrant that was used to uh, invade David Rice's house and purportedly remove a box of rock quarry dynamite, the one that I, substance that I referred to earlier. Um, that uh, search warrant was then uh, tested again in federal court before uh, Justice Warren Erbaum, uh, a very studious and a very brave uh, federal district court judge. And judge Erbaum's uh, ruling was, I am going to overturn 
and reverse a finding of a preliminary hearing judge, 12 members of a jury, and seven members of the Nebraska Supreme Court, I find that the search warrant was insufficient, it did not provide probable cause and justification, and he then ordered the state of Nebraska either to release David Rice in 60 days or to retry him. The, then the state appealed the decision of Judge Obam to the Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. The Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals approved Judge Obam's uh, rulings. The state then appealed to the full Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals. The full Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals then um, approved of Judge Obama's finding and ruling and his analysis of the Fourth Amendment and the applicable law at that time. The state then petitioned the United States Supreme Court. And if you've got another two, three hours, I will tell you <laughs> what I believe happened in the United States Supreme Court. Give us the Reader's Digest version. Um, what happened was is that I am sure that a justice... Uh, of one of the Supreme Court members at that time said, what in the world is so important uh, about this case where you have a booby trap, chicken shit killing of a police officer on the one hand, uh, and a Fourth Amendment search and seizure issue on the other hand, and uh, the state's attorney general plus uh, members of the law enforcement community were just panting and frothing at the mouth to knock out the exclusionary rule, which is the ruling that provides that if a search warrant is defective, then the fruits or the avails or what you get as a result of a bad search warrant must be thrown out of court and the evidence not available. Well, in a case called Stone versus Powell, which the Rice case was attached to, the United States Supreme Court ruled that if a state prisoner under state charges had a fair uh, opportunity to present the search and seizure issue, they couldn't renew it in federal court and reversed a very important pivotal case that provided that aperture, that opening for a state court prisoner to vindicate his federal citizenship. We all wear two hats. We are federal citizens. We are state citizens. And that uh, that porthole was uh, was uh, was closed. As a matter of fact, it's really ironic. Not only did this case come from Nebraska, but two of our United States senators from Nebraska, Senator Roman Ruskin and Senator Carl Curtis, were uh, uh, very, very verbal advocates of knocking out the exclusionary rule. Uh, God help the United States if the exclusionary rule goes down the toilet. Every, every uh, Supreme Court uh, session since, uh, since time in memoriam has been, ever since uh, the exclusionary rule was created, has, uh, has been asked to overrule the exclusionary rule. There's federal legislation to limit it and restrict it, uh, and uh, uh, it's really been a target bandied about by those who advocate uh, constitutional rights and those who want to curtail them. So that's the story. The United States Supreme Court reversed, uh, said never, never debunked, uh, uh, reversed, doubted Judge Obama's ruling. So even to this date, the, uh, the uh, ruling of Judge Obama uh, forms the basis for my belief that David Rice should be released because his conviction was based upon illegally seized evidence. David Rice and Edward Poindexter are, in, are, are in prison right now for a bombing that occurred in Omaha, Nebraska. We're looking at their case today. Two, they are just two of many names that no one knows of who are political prisoners here in America. This is Beneath the Surface. I'm your host, Kathy Still. We're going to continue with their story in just a moment right after this quick 60-second break. Stay tuned. He's the author of nine books, including The Assassination of the Black Male Image, Betrayed, The Presidential Failure to Protect Black Lives, and Blacks and Reds, Race and Class in Conflict. He's Earl Afari Hutchinson, no stranger to these microphones. He even substitutes sometimes for me when I'm not here. He's written yet another book, a very interesting one called The Crisis in Black and Black, and Earl Afari Hutchinson will be our next guest here on Pacifica's Living Room. Tune in. Living Room can be heard weekdays at 12 noon here on KPFK.
We're back on Beneath the Surface. I'm your host, Kathy Still. We're looking today at the case of two of America's political prisoners. Uh, uh, in uh, 1967, uh, the FBI launched its COINTELPRO operation under the leadership of J. Edgar Hoover, trying to basically neutralize the leadership of anyone that the government saw as an enemy of the state. Black Panther Party uh, was just one of the American Indian movement. You know the names of Leonard Peltier, Geronimo, uh, Mumia Abu-Jamal, but many others like David Rice and Ed Poindexter that we're talking about today, their names are completely unknown and we're looking at their case. Um, we just want to uh, quickly uh, summarize uh, the points of their case and then, uh, Buddy, I'd like to talk to you about the, the bigger picture of what was going on uh, with the COINTELPRO. Uh, Kitrin, can you go ahead and uh, sum up for us uh, um, uh, more of the details, the inconsistencies. There was also an emergency tape that we haven't talked about yet, a 911 tape um, that turned up when an operator, uh, uh, the operator, um, the Omaha police said that um, it was the only copy, that it was destroyed, but that uh, this operator who died had actually made a copy for himself. It turned up, and it was obviously not the voice of Dwayne Peake, who was uh, initially supposed to have called in this, this emergency call. Um, I actually, is Mr. Herzog still on the line? He is. I think he'd be a better person to talk about that one because he was directly involved in that. Oh, and I just pushed Did the you, wrong oh button. Oh, my God, you cut him, him. off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry about that. Oh, no, well, well he's gonna, coming back. I well, see the they're, little yellow light. They're, they're going to call him back. Um, um, all right, well, well, while we're waiting for him to get back on the line, let me just go back to something I was saying about the ATF warrant because I had a concluding point I wanted to make mm -hmm. about it. The night after the preliminary hearing, and the preliminary hearing was when Dave, or when uh, Dwayne Peake got on the stand and he said David Rice and Ed Poindexter had nothing to do with this bombing, and then he was dragged back to the police station and began to cry and his face got all swollen and he was brought back to court um, and then he implicated uh, Mondo and Ed. That night he wrote a letter to this woman Olivia Norris and in the letter he expresses remorse for what he had done in court and I'm just going to read a couple of sections from it here. He says, uh, the Lord knows I tried but something happened which forced me to realize that I had no alternative but to say what I said. No matter what anyone says from now on I refuse to call myself a man or anything close to a man because I did what I did. Even though there was no other way because they they already had enough evidence to convict those other two bloods. Now that, to me, that suggests he's protecting somebody else. They showed him some evidence to convict somebody else that made him feel that he had to convict Mondo and Ed. Uh, down here he says, or maybe I'm just trying to get somebody to say that what I did was justifiable, but I know it can't be justified. I not only turned against those two bloods, but I turned against myself and my own people. I could have denied everything and all three of us would have gone up to the chair. And then again, if I denied everything, one of those other bloods would have gave them a story and sent me and the other dude up. So there again, it mm -hmm. fits in with what I read you from this warrant. Two sets of brothers, Frank and Will Peake, two other brothers, and a fifth guy. You know, he, it very clearly right. shows that he's, you know, trying to protect somebody, and, and he's been made to believe that there is a whole series of people who could be convicted in this thing. Well. And I, I think that that's the meaning that I read out of this letter. And Dave Herzog, uh, quickly, can you tell us about uh, the, the tape that came, the emergency call that turned up when uh, one of the operators who died had turned up in his possessions that he'd made a copy of a recording that was supposedly the only uh, the only recording that was destroyed of of uh, this call from David P uh, from a Dwayne P. Uh, yes, that uh, 911 tape turned up almost uh, eight nine years after the trial. We had asked for the 911 tape. We were told it was destroyed. Uh, we knew about that uh, letter that uh, Dwayne Peake had. Uh, had uh, written, and uh, that was introduced in evidence. But many years later, uh, the the 911 tape surfaced. Uh, both myself, former Governor uh, Frank Morrison, and Tom uh, Kenny. Morrison and Kenny represented uh, Ed Poindexter, and I was counsel, trial counsel, and appellate counsel for David Rice. Uh, I was asked to listen to the 911 tape. During the trial and the preparation for trial, we took Dwayne Peake's deposition for, oh, I would say the better part of three full days, uh, asking him about his uh, background, his relationship with his family, his relationship with the NCCF, and so forth and so on. And I say that not to count the hours, but to indicate that I had gotten used to his voice. 
Right. 15, then 16-year-old young man. So then you heard this tape. Pardon me? So then you heard this tape. Then I heard the tape. And the tape uh, emitted the sound of a voice that had a very low register, either a basso or basso profundo uh, voice, a very low-level grumbling voice. And uh, I asked uh, if this possibly could have been the speed of the tape or some other electronic uh, uh, distortion. And they played it at various speeds, and all, all the speeds came out at the same low level. That was not the voice of uh, Dwayne Peake. So he lied under oath, Dwayne well, Peake. Uh, you know, the trial transcript will indicate, as a matter of fact, I even charted to the jury uh, at least seven stories that this young man had provided. And we should underscore at this point that without Dwayne Peake's testimony, that the case against David Rice and Egg Poindexter was barely circumstantial at best. Well, there was some other evidence. There was also what I believe to be planted evidence. There was a kernel of dynamite found in David Rice's T-shirt. Just, con just conveniently, after David Rice had the warrant had been issued for his arrest, David Rice uh, uh, authorized me to negotiate his... Uh, submission to police authority, and uh, a police officer by the name of Fernando Laquana. He wasn't an Omaha police officer. He was a, uh, an officer in the Douglas County Sheriff's uh, Department, and they maintained the, the jail in the Omaha area. He found that kernel of dynamite in his shirt pocket. Pants pocket. Amazing, amazing, almost ridiculously uh, clear plant. There's actually Other a picture of David Rice standing with his hands shoved into his pockets, waiting to get into the elevator right before he went upstairs to turn his clothes over to the police. And it was actually David Rice's pants pockets that had the dynamite in it and Ed Poindexter's T-shirt. Well, if you took your hands, and they were hot and wet and sweaty because you're, you know, turning yourself into the police on a hot August day, and you shove them into your pants, you would get dynamite all over your pants if you had chunks of dynamite in your pocket. Mm -hmm. But David Rice's hands did not test positive for dynamite. But, uh, but then the, the ATF chemist said there was so much dynamite in the pocket, it was visible to the naked eye. He didn't even have to put it under a microscope to tell it was dynamite. Well, there was some other evidence, too. There was a tool and dye expert from the ATF claimed uh, that a piece of wire that was found uh, at the explosion site matched a cutting device that was taken from David Rice's house. Uh, the number of points of comparisons of similarity and dissimilarity was a, a, a shocking piece of evidence. Uh, the dissimilarity uh, far outweighed the similarity, uh, and that bit of evidence was allowed and admitted. As a matter of fact, the trial judge, his name is Donald Hamilton, uh, went out of his way to approve the search warrant. As a matter of fact, he kind of chuckled to himself uh, sometime later that he looked at every dissenting opinion in every search and seizure case in order to validate that search warrant. So. Can I just out point? to get David Wright. Mm -hmm. um, when I was doing my research, I polled some of the jurors that I could find through the phone book, and uh, the sense that I got from them was that they were what what bowled them over was Dwayne Peake's testimony because it was so elaborate, it was so specific. It was Monday we did this, Tuesday we did this, Wednesday we did this, Thursday we did this, Friday this, and then Saturday he couldn't rec recollect what he did the day before the bombing, and then Sunday he had this elaborate uh, scheme of cars that he got in with the bomb and rode all over North Omaha. Yeah, but what about what about what Art O'Leary told? Art O'Leary was was the uh, chief trial counsel for the uh, for the state. And over and over and over again, you'd, you'd hear the refrain from Mr. O'Leary, well, it doesn't make any difference what you say. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You're going to say this. You're going to say this. You're going to say this. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But my point was, for the jurors, it was hard to believe that this kid could be lying because the story was so elaborate that he told. And I think that's what really, you know, sealed their fate was... Uh, was his testimony. Kitchen you know, did research on this case uh, since 1995. Uh, Dave Herzog is the, was the defense attorney for David Rice uh, in 1971. Buddy Hogan is also here with us in studio. He was the president of the Omaha NAACP for uh, 10 years. He's a resident here in California now and our guest today on Beneath the Surface. Buddy, we are almost out of time here. Paint this in the bigger picture, the case of Ed Rice well, and David know, Poindexter. You know, we're talking about this as though this was a legal case as though 
you could apply logic to this and somehow you'd come up with a conclusion that would be irrefutable one way or the other. The matter of the fact is that uh, this was a political uh, lynching. I mean, the, the, the whole COINTELPRO program was designed to do just exactly what they did in this case. It was to disrupt. The, the, the mood in America was different then. The police felt they were under siege. The country was under siege. There was a black revolution going on. People were afraid. They did what they thought they had to do. The hell with the Constitution. And that's pretty much what J. Edgar Hoover said. The point I'd make is that in 1974, when this became public, and the FBI admitted that they had violated the constitutional rights of hundreds of people in this country, they essentially, the government essentially apologized, said, we're sorry, we won't do that anymore. But they didn't do anything about all of the people whose rights were trampled, who were in prison, who'd been murdered. They murdered Freddie Hampton. Right. And, and, and his people in Chicago, they murdered them. Even 60 Minutes affirmed that with their own investigation. But as a result of this and any other uh, discussion, nobody's going to say, okay, let's undo what the FBI did. We in this country talk about Iran and Iraq and Libya and other countries as piranhas. Uh, we talked about Nicaragua. Uh, everybody else is violating people's political rights. We... we, we we look at Amnesty International, United Nations reports on suppression of human rights. We tie uh, loans from the International Monetary Fund to improvements in these governments, treatments of its citizen and we, citizens. And we sit right here in this country with these brothers and sisters in prison and others in their graves. And nobody says anything about it. Nobody does anything about it. And you get the general sense that nobody gives a damn. It's not about how much evidence there was at trial or anything else. The FBI has admitted that they purposely violated the rights, the constitutional rights of American citizens, and nobody's doing anything about it. One final thing, let me say this, because Mondo is a good friend of mine. By the way, his full name is Wopushitwe Mondo Ehenwilangi. Took it Thank from, you. He took it from five African languages, and it means essentially the natural... Uh, son or man-child of the son, and that really does describe him. But he was a student at, at a school I taught at and has been a friend for years. Uh, on his behalf, a uh, reporter in Omaha and myself approached then-Governor Bob Kerry. Bob Kerry is now a United States Senator. And we approached him for a pardon. We said, look, this guy has served, even if he committed this crime, he served more time than people who've been convicted and sentenced for murder. Let him go. Look at the trial and the rest. Let him go. We went to the penitentiary, and to our surprise, Kerry didn't say no. He said, I'll think about it. We went to the penitentiary, and we told Mondo what we'd done. Mondo said, buddy, call the governor and tell him to forget it. I Really, he said, whether you believe it or not, I didn't do it. I will not accept a pardon because it means I did something wrong. I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the final line for me. Well, that's going to be our final word for today. Buddy Hogan, uh, president of the Omaha branch of the NAACP for 10 years. Thank you for being with us. Kitrin Zeigel, thank you so much for your research. You've been working on this case since 1995. Dave Herzog, thank you for being with us, attorney for David Rice in 1971. Uh, Gloria Bartok, I'm sorry we did not get a chance to hear from you today. Rayanne Schmidt, I want to thank you as well. This is Beneath the Surface. I'm your host, Kathy Still. And coming up next, we're going to find out what's going on around town. Stay tuned. Less than 20 miles from the Colorado River, there will be a rally there this Saturday afternoon. For carpooling and other information, call 310-577-0817 or 760-326-6267. The federal government is threatening to greatly relax the standards by which food is labeled organic. The U.S. Department of Agriculture has recommended that food may be genetically engineered or grown on sewage sludge or irradiated and still be designated organic. They'll be taking public comments through this Thursday. The USDA's fax number is 202-690-4632 or you can send email through their website at double.